Hey, welcome, uh, Facebook Live folks. Uh, I'm here, to, I'm Dr. Bill Bird, CMO here at the hospital at CGH, and I have with me Hannah Walls. Hi, Hannah. Hello, how are you? I am very well. <laughs> I, and I know Hannah's really excited to be here and to, to get a chance to talk about her unit, aren't you, Hannah? Yes. Okay. Yep. All right, so we're on the second floor, and uh, second floor has been one of the ground zeros for taking care of COVID patients. And so we wanted to take an opportunity today just to kind of talk with Hannah as well as some of people, some of the folks on her team and kind of walk through the, the unit just to kind of give you a, a sense of how things work around here. So before I start talking with Hannah a little bit, I actually had uh, Diane over here. Hi, Diane. I, I, uh, <laughs> Diane is actually set up uh, in part of her donning and doffing that, that we have folks do when they go into COVID rooms here. And so, uh, Diane, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well, thank you. I, I don't know if you could hear that, uh, but that's part of what I wanted folks to hear is kind of how the sound is with when folks are taking care of COVID patients. So you have to kind of work when you're in a room to, re to really speak up so they can hear you. Yeah, and it's difficult for some of the elderly patients, obviously. They can't yeah. see us, they can't hear us, so it's, it's difficult for yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and I, I, I'll let you kind of go about your work, Diane, but Diane's one of our shift coordinators and uh, does a really good job. So Diane's around the hospital all over the place, just happens to be helping out with a, a patient right now. Yes. So, all right, thanks, Thank Diane. You. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what do you think we should do next? Uh, do you think we should uh, go into, take a look at just like a typical room here yeah. on the yep. floor, Hannah? In all of our patient rooms here on suck of these machines called data scopes. So that will measure blood pressure, pulse, heart rate, um, so each room has their own one of these hooked to the wall. And it's a typical hospital room. They yep. have oxygen here on the wall, which yep. obviously is a big factor for our COVID patients. Yes. Um, and then, of course, suction and that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you typically would have a TV. Talk a little bit about this. Um, I don't think there's any patient information here. So you can just nope. kind of tell in general what we have here, Hannah. Yep. So this is our board that we update every single shift. It has the nurse's name, the CNA. Um, if there's a respiratory therapist on board, which usually there is for COVID patients, um, the doctors it has um, the goals for the day for each patient. Um, they can write any questions they have, their activity level, pain. So it's really just a good um, communication board for the staff and the patients to use. Yeah, good. You know, Hannah, I know we've done some stuff in terms of um, COVID patients here on the floor mm -hmm. and trying to make and, and making this a, a safe place for the patients as well as the staff. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about what we've done with the negative pressure part of these rooms? Yes. So when um, COVID first started back in March of 2020, we made um, the second floor, this wing of the hospital, negative pressure. So each room... Um, has negative pressure, that way it's not blowing air into the main hallway and nurses station of the wing. Yeah. So that keeps our nurses safe and so they don't have to wear all of their PPE, their whole shift, they can take it off when they leave the patient's room. Yeah, so essentially there's a giant sucking sound coming from there to there yep. um, in these rooms. And so outside in the hallway and in the nurses station, we're, we're good because of that. Yep. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really big deal and it's a, it's a really good thing that we put in place here just yeah. as a result of the COVID. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. it's um, an undertaking from our staff. For our maintenance folks, they're the ones that have put that into place. So yeah. thanks to yeah. Bob and his team. So. Yeah, before COVID, we had two rooms on our floor that were negative pressure. Um, and so we've changed it so all 24 rooms are negative pressure now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, huh, huh. Lori was our employee of the month a couple That's months right. ago. Why not? Just Hi. last month. This is our employee. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get oh, right yep. between you guys. I think you were employee of the month last month, weren't you, Lori? I was. Yes, I was. Okay, congratulations again. Thank you. Yeah, did you enjoy your parking spot? I did. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> employee of the month gets like a parking spot right next to the hospital. So, hey, why, I, I just saw you and I wanted to ask you a little bit since we're here mm -hmm. on the second floor where we have, of course, regular patients and COVID patients too. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you, anything different about cleaning the room for a COVID patient and the process for that for, for housekeeping? We just take all kinds of precautions, you know, do our regular stuff that we need to do and sanitize everything, bleach everything, and yeah. just get it all taken care of. Yeah, so obviously when the patient leaves, there's like the head to toe of, oh, the, yeah. of the room. Oh, yes, yeah, from head to toe, yeah. from front to back, everywhere. Yep. How about while they're here? We go in and we take care of, wipe the high touch areas and just, you know, get their trash and 
and yeah. keep it clean then too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if folks always realize this, but um, housekeeping is really important. It's the first line of infection control. At any, it's in your house too, of course, but definitely in a hospital, it's the right. first line of infection control because if things are clean, that's the first key step in making sure that patients and staff are safe. So, Lori, thank you for the, the work that your team does. I'm, I'm speaking for your whole team. But yes, yes, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for the work that you do and a nice good chance to chat with you. Thank you. All right, all right. Take care, Lori. Yes, right, I'll let you get back to your work. So, uh, Brett, tell me what you do here on the floor. I'm the patient navigator. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, help with educating patients and discharges. Okay, yeah, so my, as a person who does some of these discharges here on the floor, Brett's the person who really helps the day you're discharging someone. You say, I'm going to have the patient on this medicine or, hey, the, make sure the pharmacy knows about this or that. That's you, Brett. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's been for you the most, some challenging things during this last 10 months trying to, to navigate navigation <laughs> with, with COVID? The hardest part is communication. Uh, patients can't understand a lot of what you're saying through the mask. Yeah. Um, so you really got to talk loud um, and getting everything set up. Yeah. A lot of uh, facilities outside of here, like O2 um, suppliers, don't go into houses. Right. So you got to set all that up to make sure they, they have what they need. When they okay. need it. Yeah. So when someone's going to go home and, and they still might be on oxygen, the, the oxygen companies are, are, what are they doing again? Uh, they don't go to the homes. Uh, is so, that just because of COVID or is yes. that? Okay. So they have, they get it. How do you get it set up for these folks then before they? Respiratory does uh, most of the leg work for it, but we have to set up whether they're going to go to the facility themselves to get in, if they're going to meet them in the parking lot. Yeah. And it just whatever works out best for our families. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Anything else that from a standpoint of the work that you've been doing here this last 10 months that has been a a challenge for you, Brett? Um, just seeing how bad COVID affects people. Yeah. Um, one day they're fine, the next day you never know what's going to happen. They could be on the bed. Yeah. Uh, just you never know what's going to hit you. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, that must be hard. Yeah. And yeah, we're not used to that on surgical floor, obviously. Um, yeah. But that that was been my biggest challenge. Yeah. Good. Hey, Brett. Thanks for the work that you do. I'm glad we had a chance to talk talk with you. I'm gonna let you off the hook. I'm gonna bring right. someone else in here, okay? Thank you. All right, thanks, Brett. <laughs> thanks, Brett. I wanted to, with, while I have Hannah here, mm -hmm. I just wanted to talk about a couple things that we're doing uh, to help communication, because Brett alluded to the communication yep. issue with COVID patients. And he had a couple things, we have a couple things that we're doing, one thing that we're doing to help with communication and one thing to help in terms of the oxygen when they go home. Yes. So Hannah, you want to talk about the this tablet and what we're doing with that? Yeah, so one big difference with COVID patients is they cannot have any family members or loved ones um, with them at the hospital. So we have these tablets where we can video chat with the family members and we can take that into the patient's room so that they can talk to their family members. And then we obviously have the telephones where we communicate very often with um, the patient's family members to give them updates. Um, and you know, alleviate any of their concerns that they might have. Yeah. How, how often does that get used, Hannah? Probably a couple times a week, depending, usually for patients that we have um, here for longer length of stays. Okay. So sometimes we have patients here for upwards of two, three weeks. Um, so then this is really used so that they can keep in touch with their loved ones. Okay, yep. yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. And, and do you want to show, me, show us this Pulse Ox yes. thing too? So Brett alluded to the fact that, you know, some of these, some of our patients either they're going home on oxygen or we want to make sure that their oxygen level off of oxygen is okay mm -hmm. when they go home with COVID because that's one of the bigger things yeah. that can bring someone into the hospital or have them come back. Yep. So you want to talk a little bit about what, what's been done to try to help with that? Yeah. So um, we send all of our patients that are um, discharged with COVID home with a pulse oximeter. So we teach them how to use that, put it on their finger and make sure that they're getting a good oxygen reading. Um, and then we also set up a telehealth visit with every patient for the next day after discharge. That way they can video conference or talk on the phone with a physician or a mid-level and make sure that their oxygen level and their breathing is still good. Yeah, so it's kind of what we kind of give in terms of the patients, what their instructions are for if, if things are okay, still going okay when they go home. Yep. And one thing I might add about this, uh, pulse oximeter 
is that this is something that the foundation, our CGH foundation, actually yes. paid for yeah. for us, and so we, they're still they're still holding out. We're still have an adequate supply for yep. folks who are discharged. Yes, yep. We still have um, plenty to give to our discharged patients, and um, it's a great um, thing that the foundation did. Yeah, yeah. So thank you to the foundation. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful because when we talk to patients. You know, it's sub sometimes they'll say, I feel short of breath, but it's hard to really know subjectively what that means. So to have someone tell you, well, I'm, on my finger here, my pulse ox is 92%, then, mm -hmm. and my pulse rate is, you know, 80, then our medical staff can much easier, be much more comfortable saying, oh, okay, I think we're okay for now, yeah. but let me know if, and Good then stuff. you have a, a piece of clinical information. So it's really helpful. Yes. Okay, I, I want to bring in another one of our team here on the second floor. Katie, do you mind coming around? Hi, Katie. Hi. Okay, <laughs> Katie's a fellow Morse. Well, I don't know if you're still a Morse tonight. Okay, <laughs> she is. All right, so, um, Katie, how long have you been a nurse? 2011. Okay, yeah, she, Katie's very young, obviously. So, <laughs> But anyhow, yeah, and you've been different places. You've, you've worked here, but I know you've worked in the clinics yeah. and other places, too. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask you, for you, what have been some of the bigger challenges you've had in trying to take care of COVID patients, Kate? Um, I would say it's hard for them to not see their families. It's hard for them to understand us. It's, you know, they're in there a lot by themselves. And so that is, that's hard to watch. Um, yeah. But as a just, nurse, as a nurse, how do you, how do you try to improve that situation? Well, the tablets have helped. They use their phones to FaceTime. We try to, you know, help them talk to their family on the phone if they're able to. Yeah. Um, try to, cause, you know, some of them are older and yeah. they don't know how to work technology that way. So we do try to yeah. help them with that and then just try to spend the time with them when we do have the time to just yeah. sit in there and be with them. Yeah. What, what have been the biggest challenges for you personally as a nurse in these last 10 months? Because you've been here on the floor. This, I see you all the time all, this past 10 months. Mm -hmm. Just, I would say the challenge is coming to work and being here on around it all the time and then going home and trying to be, live somewhat normal, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, How are you doing? Good. I mean, we have a good team here that we support each other all yeah. really well, so that's been super helpful. Yeah. Talk about that. How do you guys keep each other pumped up? Uh, pumped up is not the word, but propped up yeah. during this time. We all give each other that if we need a moment, we give it to them. We try to help each other out if one's feeling very overwhelmed with anything specific. We send, we try to go out of our way to make sure that they feel supported, yeah. whether they need something physically for a patient or if they just need right. 10 minutes in the break room by themselves yeah. to just yeah. decompress for a moment. Yeah. I know I'm putting you on the spot, but what would be something? No, it's good. It's all good. You're doing a great job. Anyway. Yeah. Um, what? What would you say is something you've learned about yourself in the past 10 months? I know, I know, I'm sorry. How about this? And you kind of alluded to this, but any, any bright spots despite all this uh, disease and everything going on here? I feel like we've come together. I mean, we've always been a really good team up here, even before COVID. Yeah. We took care of each other really well, but. I feel like even more so now. Okay. We've really come together and yeah, yeah. I'll have something. Not many people can relate to what we do every day. So yeah. the what fact you, that we can all relate is super yeah. helpful with that. Right. And I, I, I really, I know it's not easy for you to talk about this stuff, Katie, mm -hmm. but I'm glad you're here and mm -hmm. doing this because I hope the folks will get a better sense mm -hmm. of being able to relate to. Um, this is one of our hearts that you see on a window. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. But anyhow, thank you for the work you do. Yes. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Um, by the way, we're told this is Claire. Hi, Claire. Hey, David. So Claire um, you're from New No South Africa. <laughs> yes. 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 South yes. Africa. Yeah. So if you hear that that interesting accent, that's uh, that's where Claire gets that from. And by the way, Claire is now going to be getting some Starbucks because she worked a <laughs> deal with Hannah to be able to be on here with me. That that's what was needed to happen. So, yes. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about, you've been here all 10 months too. I have. Yeah, tell me about your experience and what have been some of the biggest challenges for you during these past 10 months? 
um, it's just such a change from being a surgical nurse. You know, our patients come back to us, they get better every day. Yeah. After three days, we send them home. It's such a great thing to watch. Yeah. And then our patients now come to us and a lot of the time get progressively worse. Yeah. Which is very hard to see. Yeah. Um, and just the how fast they can turn. Right. You know, you have to be on top of it all day long, making yeah. sure that their oxygen levels are up. Yeah. Because they can go from being okay to being really bad. Yeah. Very fast. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about how you try to monitor that? Because obviously you're not exactly able to, I mean, if you're in the room, you're in the room, but yeah. you, you have you can't be there all the time. So how do you try to monitor that quick change stuff? Um, the patients all have uh, pulse oximeters on and somebody upstairs is watching the oxygen levels all the time. So as soon as they drop below 90%, oh, okay. we get a call on our Bocera okay. saying room number whatever is below 90. Yeah. And this, you just get your stuff on it and get in that room. And, yeah. Because you, you can't you can't wait. Right. It can go from 90 to 80 very quick. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I, you know, obviously I've seen Claire in and out of these rooms quite a bit. And as you've gone through this process, um, what, what are some of the, what are some of the things you've learned that have uh, taken care of these patients that you didn't realize when this whole thing started that would be helpful? Um, well, we've learned to listen to lung sounds really well. <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't the top priority as a surgical nurse. Yeah. It's, it's not that we don't listen to lung sounds. No, but, but <laughs> you get really good at it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Everything about these patients has been different. You know, in the yeah. beginning, we were just really overwhelmed and, and scared. Yeah. Um, we did get more comfortable and I think experienced over these last ten months. Yeah. Um, it's just it's so hard to see the patients alone. Yeah. I think as nurses, that's probably our hardest thing to watch yeah. is that they are all alone in these rooms. Yeah. And we can't be in there as much as we could with regular patients, you know, we're yes. in and out. Yeah. But we can't just sit and chat. And for me personally, wearing a respirator and having an accent, uh -huh. it's really hard to communicate, especially with the elderly patients, yeah. um, for them to really understand us and have a good conversation with them. All right. So All right. learning how to communicate better with them. I think we've gotten better. You know, we can use whiteboards, yeah. write down questions if they're not understanding us. Or now a lot of the time I'll come out the room and phone the patient from out here uh, okay. to be able to have a good conversation. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's, so that's something you've learned as time has yep. gone by too. Yep. So you're kind of talking about the same stuff that Katie was referring to. How, how do, from your perspective, how has your team propped each other up during these difficult times? We have the best team on our second floor. We've always known that. <laughs> we, we all get along so great. But this has been, made an even bigger difference in knowing what a great team it is because everyone is there for each other. If you're not on the COVID, you know, for the day, and it's exciting to now, now especially that we don't, aren't completely full, you have days when you're not COVID, yeah. you still get your respirator out. If your teammate needs help, yeah. you put it on, you go and help. Like, and there's no... No doubt that if you need help, someone will be running in with you. Yeah. They, it's our teamwork is incredible. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Well, thank you, Claire. Thank you for the great work that you do. Thank and you. I'm so glad we had a chance to chat here. Oh, it was happy. <laughs> it was very thank good. You. Thanks, Claire. All right. So Hannah, I think uh, maybe we could go down. We're, this is also this floor also functions. Um, a small part of it is a pediatric yep. uh, floor that, that Hannah oversees. And Hannah, by the way, your official title is. The assistant manager of second floor. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we're talking to us. You know, we're talking to pretty high up here when we're talking to him. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's go on down this way, and we're going to look at this at the pediatric floor. And Hannah and I just wanted to show you a little bit about this peds part of the floor. So, we're we're standing behind a mural. You want to tell us about the mural, Hannah? Yes. This was done a couple years ago, um, just to brighten up the space and make it more. Um, Bright and lively, and for the pediatric patients. Yeah. Yeah. So when when so, so when someone walks onto the floor, this is the first thing that they yep. see. So it's it's really cool. Yeah. Kind of take a look around. So yep. she's doing the loop de doop, and then here we are. So it's just a few rooms down here because four rooms. Fortunately, nowadays, um, I remember when I first started practicing, even before that, uh, pediatrics was a lot busier um, than it is now. 
And I, I'm just going to editorialize. I think some of that has to do with, in the last 30 years or so, we've come up, we've come up with some different vaccines to control uh, certain bacteria that can cause like really bad ear infections, meningitis, those type of things, mm -hmm. and respiratory infections. And I think those immunizations um, have been very helpful in terms of reducing the pediatric census. That's my that's my sense of what's contributed to that. So anyhow, it's, it's yeah. but we still have a peds area, and yep, we sometimes have a, it's open, sometimes it's not based upon the yep, kids are here. Yep. We have four rooms, and then we also have a security system that um, is housed on the PEDS nurses station. So every PEDS patient gets a bracelet. Yeah. Um, that may, way we can make sure they're safe while they're here. Good. I wanted to ask you what I uh, asked those nurses, just at least a couple of those mm -hmm. questions. What have been some of the bright spots for you? During, I, I know, because I know this is not an easy time, but what's been some of the bright spots? I think like the nurses said, the um, support of the team um, they support one another. It's amazing to see um, how they help each other out every single day. Um, and you can tell if someone's feeling down that yeah. their coworkers, you know, lift them up. And so that's great. And then another thing is the community support has been amazing. Can you talk about that a little bit? In yeah. So we are constantly getting cards, um, food, snacks um, from the community on the second floor and other areas of the hospital that have been heavily involved with COVID. Um, there's sometimes we get stacks of um, little letters colored from churches, you know, yeah. it's been great. Um, we have windows at the end of the hallway and for a while there, two times a day, there was cars out there parked praying for the patients and the staff. Yeah. So that's been really um, great to see the community supporting us. Yeah. Yeah. So those of you who have been part of that, thank you very much. Yeah. Hannah, thanks a lot. It's been good kind of chatting with you, chatting with your team. Yeah. Kind of seeing a little bit about the floor here. And thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Hello again, Facebook Live. So I've we're, I've gone up in altitude, and now I'm up on the in the CCU on the fourth floor here at the hospital. And I have Renee Stack here with me right now. Hi, Renee. Hi, Dr. Bird. How are you? I am doing well. You're like the czar here up on the fourth floor, right? What's your... I, um, I'm Renee. I'm Assistant Nurse Manager of Critical Care, Cardiology Services, and Cardiac Rehab. And yeah, I, I kind of help run the shift a little bit. How long, yeah. been running, how long have you been up here? Um, I've been up in this department 17 years, in the hospital itself 21. Yeah. Um, and we have a wonderful director, Alice, and I work under her, and she's mentored me up to where I'm at today. Yeah, and you start, you were a teenager when you started. I right? was, yes, I was 18 when I was a CNA, started on medical I was just floor. kidding, you were. No, I was, oh, okay. I was 18. <laughs> All right. Yep, I was All 18, right. and right. I, you don't even know my age, but right now. We're getting a pretty good idea of it, yeah. so uh, anyhow, uh, Renee's a lifer here yeah. at the hospital, yeah. so. Glad we could chat a little bit. I know eventually we're going to pull some of your team members in like we did the second floor. I want to chat with them. Hi, Jill. Um, so what I want to do, though, before we start talking to some of your team members, just talk about a few things that are unique to the floor. So first of all, uh, can you kind of talk about that, Liz, if you may want to kind of roll just mm -hmm. a little bit this way? What, what exactly is so this? These are cameras. We have a secured um, security system in the hospital organization now. So we can monitor who comes down our hallways. Um, we can close our doors for patient safety or if there's any of uh, uh, security yeah. issue. And so then we can see who is coming and who is going um, just for the safety of the patients and our yeah. staff. So this is a crash card. We have them in every department. So if someone comes in and they're not breathing or then respiratory failure or their cardiac arrest, um, this is what we pull out and we hook them up and we can bring them back to life and do all the heroic measures, medications, everything that we could do for an ACLS protocol to resuscitate the, the patients if needed. So these are huge life-saving measures that we use in this hospital. Yep, yep. Unfortunately, they get used. They do get used. Um, I know from my experience, we've used three in one day. Um, and that's a busy day, to be honest, in a small community hospital. But it does happen. Yeah. Um, but they are a life so yep. They're saviors yep. most of the time. Now Renee and I are in one of our one of the CCU rooms, and Renee, you want to just kind of talk talk through for the folks who are watching what what makes this a, an ICU room? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have 18 rooms in our department. Eight of them are like this; they're intensive care units. We have hard wire that we can do anything from an EKG to cardiac monitoring to blood pressure to oxygen level um, and heart rate here constantly. 
they go under their bed. We use our IV pumps throughout the hospital to give cardiac medications or sedation medicines. Um, we have suction, we have temperatures, we have everything that you would need in an event of an emergency or just a normal care of a patient. We do add to our side wall over here because of the COVID pandemic we have converted all of our rooms to negative pressure. So each of our rooms, the maintenance POM, I'm gonna take a shout out to them, they've converted a window, window panel yeah. and they have made um, each room negative pressure. So when a patient is in a room that is COVID positive, we turn that fan on and it makes it a negative pressure room. Yeah, we talked about this on the second floor, they've done that on the second floor mm -hmm. as well. And so yeah, there's once again, kind of a giant, literally a giant sucking sound as yes. that fan is pulling stuff out of this room and keeping it out on that common area where Renee and I are at. So. And we, like every other floor, has computers in the room so we can chart at the bedside, keep it within yeah. the patient so the patient stays involved in their care. Yeah. The other thing, I, I just like it on the second floor, if we could kind of come this way, Renee, um, we, we have the same sort of whiteboard thing that, that we have in play. Liz is trying to get, catch up with us here. So you want, I'll let you kind of yes. talk a little bit about that so too. These are our, um, boards that we have in every patient room. It's kind of like our communication board. So it keeps everybody on the same page. We can tell who the provider is, who the nurse is, the CNA, how many times the patient has got up or ambulated throughout the day. If physical therapy has any communication, they can write, as well as um, respiratory, um, blood sugars, anything you want to convey to relay. And it keeps the patient involved in their care. So if we put goals on every day, um, to have a goal that the patient can look forward to, we address it daily. Yeah, yeah thanks, Renee. And I think one other thing that I, I think we didn't show you in the, on the second floor, but something that's in those rooms that's a little different here is uh, there's not a bathroom in this room. Well, there is. So it's, let's talk about that. Yes. Yeah, so it's um, a little different. That's what is. I wanted to bring to everyone's attention. It is a little different, and it's one of our... <laughs> Biggest complaints of patients, but most of the time they're in our department, they're so sick that they don't get up to go to the restroom. But due to safe space, our bathroom is under here. And it's like a, I call it a camper toilet because it's literally it's a camper toilet. You sit and you flush. This is the flush button, but it helps um, conserve space. And if patients want to ambulate to go to the restroom, they can. And it's kind of convenient, actually. Yeah. And it's really nice to have. Yeah, we kind of joke about it. Do the patients that are campers complain too, or is it just the non-campers? It's just the, the whole, the whole <laughs> know, concept just, of a I toilet know. underneath the sink is just not it's just, normal. It's, it's, yeah, wild, wacky stuff. Yes. So, but it's just what we do. It is what we do, and it helps the safe space in the unit, so we can at least have more room for the patient care. Yeah, yeah, good. Good, so uh, that's you know an ICU room. The, the secret sauce, of course, in these rooms is not the physical getup, although that's part of it. The secret sauce is the doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists yes. and everyone else and the medicines and, and the treatments yes. that, that we are able to deliver here. Yes. But I did want at least to get, give everyone a chance to see the... Yeah, because this is a lovely room, but sometimes it gets very congested with the cardiac medicines. We could have those IV pumps that we showed earlier, we could have five of them in a room just for one patient and beside a breathing machine and yeah. all kinds of bells and whistles. So yeah. it takes a good team effort to take care of patients that I see you. Yeah, which goes to this whole toilet thing. So it's not like we're just trying to uh, <laughs> sadistically yeah. want folks to have, not have a bathroom. It's, Correct. By the time this thing, for some really sick patients, it gets really full really quick. It does, it does. And then the best part about using the toilet is when they're on the mental recovery to go to the other floor, they can start transitioning to a toilet and then it's like jumping up in the world to go yeah. down to another floor. Ooh, I have a shower and <laughs> yeah. an actual toilet with a door. Yeah, yeah right. So it's, it's fun. Right. Okay, so before we start chatting with your staff a little bit, Renee, I did want to take a moment to ask you a couple questions. Okay. So what, what would you say has been, have been some of the biggest challenges for you in these last 10 months? The biggest challenges I feel is being as a team leader and the team that we had, because I've done bedside care when we need it, um, the busy, it's just really hard to have the families not be present at the time during the last 10 months. That's the biggest impact that we had just for staff and us. Yeah. Um, we are, we're nurses, we do a great job, but we're not family. Family is everything. And that was the hardest thing for, for nursing staff to, um, to handle during this pandemic, because this is not something we've ever trained for. You can't 
do a drill for this pandemic. It's just here it is, and yeah, it's bells to the whistles. Yeah. And what are some of the things was, you've done up here on the floor to try to help with that? We have done a lot of EPA stuff. We've done what does EPA EPA is um, it's an employee assistance program through for therapy and try to counseling to try to help them get through this difficult situation because I'm not lying it is very emotionally and mentally exhausting to take care of sick patients when our goal in healthcare is to give everything we can do the best we can yeah. and no matter what we're doing and it, sometimes it doesn't work and that's kind of like a defeat to us because we like to be like to make them get better to let them go home and and sometimes that doesn't happen um, so we needed to have someone to talk to us so we can try to help relieve some of that stress. Um, a, a lot of good things that come through that is the community outreach, because having the signs out, people from kids' schools making cards, and they're all over our lockers, just, and the community bringing little, little goodie bags just to pep up our positivity, because that, that's what got us through these 10 months. It's, it's um, I can't even describe what 10 months has been. You've, done a, you've started on them. That's really good, just some of that feedback. So folks that have been part of that, thank you. And sometimes those little things that, that you don't think would mean a lot, they do. They do, and even if it's just a small trinket. Like for this example is uh, some from a family member. Um, it, it was a thank you card and they remember some nurses there. So whatever name that nurse got, we wanted to say thank you and they wanted to give us a token of appreciation for their loved one when they passed. Mm -hmm. So just those small things mean the world to the nursing staff because that we love healthcare. That's why we're here for the patients. And when the families couldn't be, we were there for them. Yeah. yeah. So it was like a thank you for the whole yeah, community. For sure. Let me ask you one other question before we get to some of your team, Renee. Um, you've been here for quite a while. How is, how is this COVID situation, how's it different than a really bad flu year? So unfortunately, I have been here for a while. I cannot express what COVID has done to people. Everybody reacts differently to the virus. Um, and, and at first, like I could hear flu is just the flu. COVID is, I have not seen more death in my career in the last 10 months than I've ever seen before. It is, it, what it does to a patient when they're at the sickest of the sickest, I don't wish that on anyone in the world. It is a terrible, terrible virus and everyone responds differently but it's something that I don't want to go through again. It's- we, And with a typical bad flu season, you, you know, people do get sick and do die, but it's it, nothing to the Nothing ex to the extent, because it, it affects their their breathing. They can't even like go from me to Dr. Bird. If I walk one step, they desat. Their oxygen level goes down and it's crazy how you watch it because it just happens. And it takes so long for them to recuperate because it just attacks the lungs differently. Yeah. And it's it's really, um, it was a big eye opener yeah. to how it affects patients. Yeah. It is not the flu, yeah. it, not at all like the flu. Yeah, thanks for that, Renee. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna um, go to some of uh, Renee's team and chat with them a few minutes. Okay, so now I'm here up, up on the fourth floor in, in the CCU <clears throat> with a couple of our nurses. So I have Lexi, hi mm -hmm. Lexi. Hi. And Jill. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. So I'm going to ask um, Jill, how long have you worked up here in the CCU? Um, 12 ish years. Okay, all right. And you've been a nurse for how long? 13. Okay, all right, all right. So you're, basically your whole career yes. has been up here in the, in the ICU. Yes. How about you, Lexi? Um, I have only started here since October, and I graduated with my RN in May. Okay. So we have different ends of the spectrum here um, in terms of nursing staff. So, uh, Lexi, you, you joined us right at the height of the surge that we were having. And, Jill, you've been with us throughout the last 10 months. Yes. Okay. So it's going to be good to have both of your perspectives on this. And these questions I'm going to ask you. Okay, so. Okay. Yeah, oh, it's all good. Yeah, can you pin or buzz or no? Yeah, no. Yeah, you can, you can, you can, you can pretend like you're buzzing. That's fine, okay. Jill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what have some of the, been some of the biggest challenges for each of you during this period of time? For me, I think as a nurse, not being able to be as present with the patients as what 
I would like. You've got, you know, big mask on, you've got gloves, your gown, you know, you can't touch them with a glove stand you can, but they can't hear you, you can't hear them. It, it just doesn't feel like we can connect with them as much and I So how do you try to work through that as a nurse? Well, you know, I just try to get down by the ear and, and talk to them and assure them that we're here. Yeah. And yeah. you're not alone, you know, and then their families aren't here. Yeah. And you know, we are no substitute for family. No yeah. no substitute, but we have to try to be. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's very, very hard. Yeah. For those of you listening, that's a theme. We heard that same theme on the second floor, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, Lexi, how about you? Brand new nurse, okay. show up, and all of a sudden you're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I guess trying to learn during this time. Luckily, I have three nurses to learn from. Um, and then, as Jill said, not having their loved ones here, I mean, that it's a hard time, and we're also limiting our exposure, so we're going to group things together and only go in so often. Um, and just trying to communicate with that's the hardest thing to just tell them over the phone and not be able to see them in person. Yeah. And again, yeah. wearing the mask, I mean, it's hard. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because for those of you who are viewers and watching, I get questions, if not every week, every other week, asking. <clears throat> it's really basically the line of, of, of conversation is I, I wish I could see my loved one. Mm -hmm. So just know, folks, that mm -hmm. these folks are struggling with that as much as you are. In terms of the ability to, to, they want you to be able to be here too. So it's, um, we all want that. We all want to try to get to that as, as soon as we can, but that's where we're at right now in terms of trying to be safe. So um, what have you learned? Okay, this is one that I ran on the second floor and, and try your best. I got two of you so you can both be thinking about this. What have you learned about yourself um, in the past 10 months? And since this kicked off, uh, for you in, in October? I think I, I think I know I'm resilient, but I, I think that it's just, it just shows up more. That you just keep going. Yeah. You just keep going. Yeah. How do you compartmentalize being here and then being out of here in terms of emotionally turning things off and on? I, I know this has been really tough on you. I don't know if you can't really. I, I, I sometimes think I don't even know how to process it. I just kick into that resiliency mode and just try to power through it because I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. You know, faith obviously is, is very important to me, but um, it's, it's tough. Yeah. It's yeah. tough. Yeah. How about you, Lexi? Um, I definitely learned um, compassion, I think, being compassionate for our patients, especially during a lonely and hard time for them, um, and to turn it off. I mean, I have a great support system at home, and I think that's the best thing, having a husband and family that's willing, with two little ones at home, to take them so I can just get a moment to myself after 12 plus hours of being here. Yeah, yeah. Um, this, this, I, I know this is kind of a weird question, but what have been the bright spots during this really tough time? Patients that get to go home, getting able to send them to reconnect with their loved ones after sometimes months of being here. Okay. Yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. really cool. Because the reality is not everyone passes no. away who has COVID. No, I mean, not everybody, but yeah. Yeah. the ones that, yeah, the that ones. do get to go home, it's, I mean, I think that's why we continue, why we keep going, and yeah. for me at least. Yeah. How about you, Jill? Community. I, I think it's it's really humbling to see the people that send messages and care. And we leave work and we see groups of people praying for somebody that they love, you know, in the room above them. And that, that person doesn't even, you know, know it. But, yeah. Um, or the ladies or and gentlemen, I'm sure too, that would sit in the parking lot and pray for us and for the patients. People that bring us food, which yeah. you know, and we have jobs. There are there are people that through this horrible thing yeah. suffer and don't even have I can buy my food. I have a job. I, but I, I know it's um 
it's just humbling and the and community and the cards that the kids send us yeah. and it's all very humbling and, yeah and appreciated yeah how, how does your team work together to kind of try to help each other out during all this too i i think we have fantastic team up here i could work somewhere that didn't Something happens, and you know, you can. I can count on everybody here to be their family, and that's just what we do. Yeah. You've been pretty new at this. What has yeah. what your perspective been on, uh, on how, how everyone helps each other up, kind of prop each other up around here? The teamwork is great. Um, I've worked in other healthcare systems as well, and they were good too. But I mean, being here and learning from nurses that have been here for 20, 30 years, I mean, it's, and everyone is willing. You, if you, if I need something, they're willing to stop and come help me. Um, directors do it. I mean, yeah. I am amazed with the teamwork they have here. Yeah, I heard that on the second floor pretty loud and clear too. So mm -hmm. it's really good to hear mm -hmm. that. So, um, like I, I said before, down on the second floor, when you see the hearts in the windows, mm -hmm. these are the hearts. <laughs> So and the community, right, right. The hearts. Yeah. So, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jill mm -hmm. and Lexi for the work that you do, and uh, thank you for a chance just to kind of share your experiences here and being on this Facebook Live. Yeah. And thank you for supporting us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We Wonderful. appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, ladies. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank appreciate you. it. Thank One you. last thing I wanted to get an opportunity to show you and show off here um, at uh, CGH. I'm still in the on, in the CCU with Renee. We're in the special procedure room. And so Renee, you want to talk about this room and what we use it for? So the special procedure room is, is what it is. We um, do bedside bronchoscopies. We do EVOSs. So bronchoscopy. A bronchoscopy is a, normally it is from a lung doctor. You go to the clinic to get a lung doctor appointment. And if they feel you need uh, to take a little scope that goes down their nose or their mouth, goes into their lungs, and they can suck out all that bad stuff or do biopsies if needed. Um, we do all of that here, and then we send those specimens to the lab. Unless it's an EVUS, which is more of an endobronchial ultrasound guided bronchoscopy, those are all respiratory driven, but sometimes we have labs here and we can see preliminary readings if there's um, cancerous or um, different shaped cells that yeah. would need more treatment quicker. Yeah. So we do those here. Um, at times, um, we do all of our pick lines up here. So what's a pick line? So a pick line is a IV that's peripherally inserted by a uh, centrally lined by a nurse. So myself is on the pick team. Um, two other nurses are on the pick team. One of them is Beth. Um, can I say? Yeah, Beth Vandersnake sure. and Erica Adams. Those are the three that are on for the CGH. Um, so we bring the patients in here, and they it's a big IV that goes in the tip of their heart to do long-term antibiotics or nutrition via IV. So that way if they have a big infection and they are ready to go home but they still need antibiotic therapy, they yeah. can do that at home or come in and have it without getting stuck all the time. Yeah, just a safer way. To... It is safer and nursing can put it in yeah. under sterile technique with ultrasound guidance and it's, so it's better. So you do that here too? We do that here too. Um, we've done cardio versions here and that is when a heart rate of someone, you know, the atrial fib or your heart's not beating correctly. We bring them in here and we can shock their heart into a regular rhythm. And we do TE sometimes in here if cath lab is unable to perform them, which is a big scope that goes down your throat and it looks at all of your heart valves and all the muscles, the ventricles, the atriums, just to see if there's anything going on inside your heart. Yeah, people have to get sedated for that. So they that do. Works, yeah. we, um, obviously, if you have a big tube going down through your. Yes, it's all minor sedation and 90% of the time the cath lab does it for us, but. They could have a busy day and they add on a TE, so CCU staff will come in and yeah. take care of that too. Yeah. What's, what's that right there, Renee? So this is a CR. I'm pointing to this right here. Yes. So this is a CR and this oh, will allow it. us, um, it's more radiology driven, but it can take it around and the bed that you saw here is x-ray compatible. So they would take it over here and take pictures of the lungs. Uh, for biopsies, lumbar biopsies, liver but whatever they So need. it's like real time. So if I'm putting an, a, a scope or a needle in something, this, this C arm is seeing that via like an x-ray the whole time yes. you're doing that, so you can be very precise. Yes, that is what this does. I have nothing to do with this baby because it's a whole other world. 
and DID does that. DID is our expert department. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's a great thing because we can do real time treatments right here yeah. in this room with this bed. Yeah. And, and you probably noticed this, but we have a crash cart in this room. Um, obviously, these procedures are procedures where crash carts once in a while are necessary. So, yep, yeah, uh, it's right here so that we can make this as safe as possible if something doesn't go the way that we intend. Yes, so, that is. Yeah, good. Renee, I feel like this has been good. This has been good kind of walking through and talking to you, talking to your team, seeing some of the stuff up here on the floor. Once again, thank you. Uh, I mean, I know we run each other all the time, mm -hmm. but, but really thank you and uh, for the folks who are listening. Thank you for all the, the work that you guys have been doing for the past 10 months. It's phenomenal. Well, thank you to all your support. Thank you to the supporters, because I don't think we would be where we're at today if it wasn't for the community um, reaching out to us, because it, it really makes a big difference in all of our lives. Yeah. Thank you for all, all of you for watching. Uh, yeah, thanks for watching, they appreciate it.